This is a special honor for us today to have Gary Gillum with us. We would like to make a, spe a special presentation to Gary, and to do that, we have the director of the library, Randy Olson. I'm delighted today to honor a great colleague and friend, Gary Gillum, by presenting him with the Library Faculty Professionalism Award. Gary began working in the library in 1971 after earning a Bachelor's of Arts degree at Concordia Seminary and a Master's of Library Science degree from Brigham Young University. His professional work experience has been rather eclectic. He served as a music librarian at the Indianapolis Public Library and then later went on to perform contract work for NASA on a precursor to the space shuttle. But Gary's heart has always been with matters of faith and at BYU he has followed his heart. Delving into religious studies librarianship, Gary has made major contributions in, to improving the quality and depth of library holdings in Old Testament, New Testament, world religions, and Mormon studies. As a practicing scholar, he has published in these areas and selflessly served on editorial boards of important journals such as BYU Studies and Dialogue. In a few minutes, we'll hear more about his involvement with Professor Hugh Nibley's works and I believe that you'll be impressed by Gary's thoughtful, complete, and professional custodianship of this great man's singular contribution to the spiritual side of the life of the mind. A consummate professional librarian, Gary has a tender and giving heart, the true comportment of a disciple of Christ. We honor today the professional contributions of a great BYU librarian, but we also honor the life of a humble servant, father, and husband. Brothers and sisters, please join me in the expression of our appreciation and gratitude for the accomplishments of Gary Gillum. I guess we can bring the house lights down now. I'd first like to thank my library colleagues for the years of support they have given me in my journeys into Nibley scholarship as well as uh, in many areas, other areas of my uh, librarianship here. And I thank you very much. Now before I launch into the topic of this lecture, I want to in avoid the inevitable question at the end about how I became involved with Hugh Nibley by relating it to you first. When I was investigating the church in 1969, after spending seven years to study for the ministry of, of uh, the gospel, there were two things that I was reading at the time. The Book of Mormon and an article someone had given me to read in the January 1969 Improvement Era called, quote, A New Look at the Pearl of Great Price, unquote, by someone named Hugh Nibley. I had never heard of the Pearl of Great Price or of Brother Nibley. But what really surprised me as I read the article was that anyone could combine faith and scholarship in such a remarkable manner, especially after I had read so much Protestant theology. After my baptism, I gradually read more articles by this interesting scholar. A few months after joining the church, I found myself at BYU and drawing on my undergraduate languages of German, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, was soon involved with the Ancient Studies Library and its premier and most frequent user, Dr. Hugh Nibley. I became his personal librarian, indexing his writings to that point, and eventually helping farms in editing three of the 16 extant volumes. And then come, came the humbling epiphany, as I reflected on my life not too long ago, that the Lord had transformed me away from family, culture, religion, career, and friends to, quote, call me on a lifelong mission to work with Hugh Nibley and all of the ramifications of doing so for the last 30 years. But the most wonderful thing about Nib this Nibley connection was how his scholarship augmented my professional librarianship and personal life, even while my library skills enhanced his research. Hence, my observations will be from the perspective of a generalist, a librarian, and a friend who recognizes where Nibley has applied his considerable gifts. Hugh Nibley closed his letters with a great variety of humorous salutations, such as, Goobers to all, 
or your hand-pecked grandson. However, one wonders if he was doing more than merely jesting when he closed the September 24, 1971 letter to his missionary sons, quote, as per ever, huge, windy nebula, unquote. I will briefly explore his unique style of scholarship under these three rubrics, huge, windy, and nebula, with three attributes under each section. From the outset, I wish to point out that these nine points overlap somewhat and that these initial observations are also highly personal and idiosyncratic, a work in progress, meaning that I am willing and eager to entertain any ideas that any of you may have on this topic. And here are the nine points. Huge. With the publication last week of the second edition of Nibley's The Message of the Joseph Smith Papyri, an Egyptian endowment, I was tempted to abbreviate this huge section. For this volume 16 in the Nibley Collected Works is definitely huge by almost any standards. How fitting also that it appears during the library's wonderful Joseph Smith exhibit next door to this auditorium. This tome represents most of the principles that I will be talking about. It was, in fact, Joseph Smith, quoted by Nibley in Educating the Saints, who gave the ultimate guideline for Latter-day scholarship. Quote, Thy mind, O man, if thou wilt lead a soul to salvation, must stretch as high as the, the utmost heavens, and search into and contemplate the darkest abyss and the broad expanse of eternity." Unquote. As Nibley's prophetic mentor, Joseph was wont to swim in deep waters and then share his insights with the, science, with the saints. Nibley could do no other, nothing otherwise. Number one, he was polymathic and broad-ranging in his research pursuits. Nibley's insatiable curiosity embraced anything and everything in and out of time and space. His spiritual, intellectual, emotional, and physical curiosity and awareness are legendary and led him to everything from camping alone in the same neighborhood as the bears and wolves around Crater Lake to methodically perusing the spines of thousands of books in the Berkeley Library pulling off the shelves only those titles which showed promise for research. In the words of Zora Neale Hurston, author of Their Eyes Were Watching God, quote, research is formalized curiosity. It is poking and prying with a purpose, unquote. Despite his receiving a PhD from Berkeley in the 1930s, Nibley was a tabula rasa or blank slate like that of Joseph Smith who had little formal education. Yet their self-education has made both of them almost extraterrestrial scholars because of their amateur big picture perspective and their combining of mortal and eternal principles. Most certainly, Nibley gleaned much more from his autodidactic tendencies than from his university degrees. He was careful and wise to point out, however, that being self-taught is no disgrace, but being self-certified is another matter." Unquote. His openness and humility in his research was occasionally criticized as naive, vulnerable, and gullible by other scholars. But he paid little attention to other scholars and their opinions, feeling that many of them were too afraid of being embarrassed if they were to step out on so many research limbs. His broad-ranging explorations and observations also helped him to develop many of his writing styles, for he did not possess merely one. His wife, Phyllis, told me that he liked to read fiction occasionally to escape from the pressures of scholarship. As I've processed his book collection, I've collected no less than 14 Agatha Christie mysteries, gleaned from four different rooms in his house. A comment in Christie's Caribbean Mystery hints that he was conscious of his own writing. Quote, Christie manages to keep up with the times by getting older. <laughs> Superb, unquote. <laughs> A further example, box eight from his northwest bedroom on the south wall was my favorite box. 
um, it included the following titles and informs of his, us of his eclectic interests and collecting and studying habits. Frank Waters, The Book of the Hopi. Robert Merriam's The Battle of the Bulge. The Lost Books of the Bible and the Forgotten Books of Eden. The Colorado Plateau as a Holy Land. And John Nyhart's Black Elk Speaks. I'm putting up a couple of slides here to show you the process of my going through these books. These boxes have been retrieved from the far reaches of the stacks of special collections, brought to this processing room, and, and then I've decided which volumes go where, and they will ultimately all end up here in the Hunibly Ancient Studies room on the fifth floor, uh, room 5431, where they will have their final resting place. This is as it looked up two days ago. Eventually, all these shelves will be filled with his books. It is these multidisciplinary discoveries which led him to explore patternism, cross-disciplinary insights, ambiguities and subtleties, and even the interconnectedness of all topics as proceeding from God. He was thus aware and alert to all ideas. Two. All knowledge is an open canon. There are no boundaries. Most of our Latter-day Prophets, from Joseph Smith to Gordon B. Hinckley, have encouraged the saints to seek and embrace truth wherever they may find it. Nibley was an arch proponent of this principle, and Jack Welch agrees, quote, any subject mentioned for Nibley is an open invitation to discuss matters of universal significance, unquote. In order to do so, Nibley necessarily used a this big picture or high altitude understanding and was not beholden to one, any one narrow scholarly methodology. He defended his perspective with the following, quote, blindness to larger contexts is a constitutional defect of human thinking imposed by the painful necessity of being able to concentrate on only one thing at a time. We forget as we virtuously concentrate on that one thing that hundreds of other things are going on at the same time and on every side of us. Things that are just as important as our object of study and that they are all interconnected in ways that we cannot even guess. Sad to say, our picture of the world to the degree to which it has that neatness, precision, and finality so coveted by scholarship is a false one." Unquote. I found an example of this in an unpublished paper Plato's Republic, which he wrote for a class at UCLA in the 1930s while still an undergraduate. He was writing about the Dark Ages where he saw a lot of faulty education. He called it, quote, a time of illusions when all Europe would be moved and its life directly influenced by the birth of a child with a golden tooth, or a saint become the guide and claim the fealty of men because he had, she had succeeded in roasting a batch of snowballs or fetching sunlight into a monastery with a bucket." Unquote. The Dark Ages exemplified a time when academic scholarship often had too many creeds and closed canons. And we as Latter-day Saints know the danger of closed canons. For just as a closed canon of scripture is problematic, so also are closed canons in academic systems. But Nibley felt that these closed canons exist even today and are the same limitations which haunt mainstream Christianity and their closed canon of scripture. Quote, hermeneutic blindness, androcentric presuppositions, as well as Eurocentric, patriarchal, and dehistoricized assumptions of the past, unquote. Add to this the more common limitations of superstition, pride, prejudice, ignorance, traditions, and ego, and one wonders if anything at all can be known for certain. Nibley has even had to fight against the traditional attributes of scholarship since the Enlightenment, which are the abstract in favor of the concrete and the theoretical over common sense knowledge. Perceiving these limitations has led to some additional salient thoughts from Nibley. Quote, now the office and calling of scholarship and science is to investigate the unknown, unquote. And, quote, all scholarship, like all science, is an ongoing, 
open-ended discussion in which all conclusions are tentative forever. The principal value and charm of the game being the discovery of the totally unexpected." Unquote. Finally, quote, let us not seek to hold God to the learned opinions of the moment when he speaks the language of eternity. Unquote. Fortunately for us, Nibley ignored some of the errors some unfortunate scholars have favored over the centuries and which would call into question any of Nibley's works. These are Neoplatonic Hermeticism, Syncretism, Mysticism, and Astrological Speculation. Three, studying original languages and cultures enhanced his research. We will never know exactly how many languages Brother Nibley was able to use for his research, for he probably had no idea himself. He merely used them as tools. But one of his army buddies at Camp Ritchie during World War II, George Bailey, put it this way in his book, Germans. Quote, I knew a sergeant at Ritchie, Hugh Nibley, formerly professor of ancient history at Pomona College, who spoke 16 languages tolerably well and whose nodding linguistic acquaintanceship included twice that number, unquote. As I work with Nibley's book collection in the archives, I note that many of the notes he has made in these 2,000 plus volumes are in modified Greg shorthand in at least one of his many foreign languages. But then his dabbling in 32 languages, give or take a few, is only an infinitesimal foray into the 6,912 languages existing in 228 countries. Yet, according to Lewis Midgley, Nibley's bibliographer and a colleague of Nibley's for many years, Nibley was able to enjoy veil partings because, quote, his comparisons over time between cultures yielded new insights on old beliefs and scriptures, unquote. Having such facility with languages made it easier to study the cultures behind these languages as well as to avoid faulty translations, although Nibley certainly wasn't perfect in all his own translations. If he were alive today, he would most certainly run out to buy a text on the Bosnian language after learning that a certain hill in Bosnia-Herzegovina hides a real pyramid predating 600 AD, supposedly built by the Illyrian peoples. Or he would be excited by the new book to be published in April, and which I reviewed for Library Journal last month, in which the author, a pastor named Brian D. McLaren, declares at least six of our LDS principles as lost to the world for 2,000 years. He is proclaiming these principles as the secret message of Jesus. It will no doubt ruffle the feathers of many mainstream Christians as they discover that McLaren's book is mostly what Latter-day Saints have been teaching for over 175 years. Nibley would have had a field day reviewing this book. Mostly important, most Importantly, however, Nibley came close to Joseph Smith's practice in language study. Associate Vice President John S. Tanner quotes Terrell Gibbons as saying, quote, Joseph consistently merged the gift of prophecy with the gritty work of language study, unquote. So did Nibley, if only as an unfrocked academic prophet. Nibley's use of languages was downright powerful, as pointed out by one of the students in my Nibley class this semester already, when giving his reasons for taking my class, quote, I enjoy Nibley's wit, meticulous notes and source material, power over languages, and even his sarcastic snort, unquote. And this leads us to the next attribute, Wendy. At a three-part lecture series called The Three Shrines, which he gave at Yale University in 1963, Brother Nibley described the windy part of his scholarship. Quote, the spirit bloweth where it listeth. It does not wait upon human convenience, nor do its manifestations comply with human expectations. Its operations are always surprising. They always catch men off guard, unquote. How did the spirit operate with Nibley's scholarship? I will talk about three aspects of this windy portion of his scholarship learned behavior, attitude, and receptivity. Number four, by study and also by faith, a learned behavior. 
Nibley often spoke of how important it was to exercise our scholarship with both the mind and the spirit, or study and faith. If Nibley is indeed an academic prophet, he would necessarily have to advocate and speak innovatively for a cause. For those of us here who have listened to Nibley ex extensively, even when he was not espousing a cause or discussing a topic few people could understand, the audience would at least catch his enthusiasm. Now the word enthusiasm comes from two Greek New Testament words, en and theo, meaning near God. I believe that his enthusiasm was maintained for the most part because of his consistent life of faith in public and private, his frequent temple attendance, and his unwavering teaching that there are two things we Latter-day Saints should do exceedingly well during this life, repent and forgive. As I pointed out in a symposium talk I delivered in 1985, repentance also means rethinking, changing our mind or heart to be more in tune with the Lord's. This is from another two Greek words, meta and noia, meaning change of mind. Often when I'm reading something of Nibley's, I perceive that he is thinking with his heart and feeling with his mind. The importance of learning by study and faith is common knowledge in our university setting. Indeed, it is part of BYU's mission statement. Even our university motto, the glory of God is intelligence, leads us to the exciting promise that, quote, if your eye is single to my glory, your whole body will be filled with light, unquote. Doctrine and Covenants, section 88, verse 67. Number five, the mantic or sophic perspective, an inborn or converted attitude. Nibley gives us a very basic definition of these two terms in his Three Shrines talk at Yale. Both ideas were very important at the time of Socrates and in Greek society. Quote, mantic simply means prophetic or inspired, oracular, coming from the other world and not from the resources of the human mind. The mantic accepts the other worlds as part of our whole experience without which any true understanding of this life is out of the question. Sophic, on the other hand, is the tradition which boasted its cool, critical, objective, naturalistic, and scientific attitude." Unquote. A mantic or prophetic perspective is that which unhesitatingly accepts supernatural occurrences and, feeling, and feelings as true reality. A sophic or philo philosophic perspective, on the other hand, is a humanistic reliance on the powers of mankind alone. As a theology student, it was very easy for me to get caught up in the sophic realm of religion with its naturalism, reductionism, higher criticism, ecclesiocentrism, and near idolatry of both scriptures and theology. As I look back, it was an atmosphere similar to Joseph Smith where, quote, they worship me with their lips but their heart is far from me." Unquote. Genetic and environmental backgrounds usually determine whether a person has a mantic or sophic perspective towards reality. We need only think of the differences between Nephi and Laman. But these predispositions can be changed by conversion, a process we Latter-day Saints are all encouraged to participate in, whether we are born in the church or not. Most universities are Sophic, but Brigham Young University is one of the few where there is a combination of the Sophic and the Mantic, where a testimony is fully acceptable for spiritual matters, while scientific proof is mandatory for mental and physical disciplines. But the Mantic perspective is usually inclusive of the Sophic, whereas the opposite seldom occurs. In other words, an inspired and Mantic LDS scientist, or someone like Albert Einstein, can use the spirit to assist him in scientific research, while the Sophic scientist feels that he has no recourse but his own mind. A Sophic person is not necessarily an atheist. He can be religious without calling upon the powers of heaven. Now, although our world is decidedly Sophic and secular, there are hints that civilization is becoming more mantic. Three recently published books in the last six months show this. Mark Patrick Hederman's Walkabout, Life as Holy Spirit, Margaret Barker's An Extraordinary Gathering of Angels, and Matthai Cadaville's The World as Sacrament, The Sacramentality of Creation. 
all give witness to this movement outside Mormonism. One of my favorite passages in McLaren's The Secret Message of Jesus applies to everyone and when it comes to mantic or sophic worldviews or perspectives. Quote, a worldview is a way of seeing. It's not just what we see, but how we see everything else. It's the lens through which we see, a lens of assumptions, beliefs, images, metaphors, values, and ideas that we inherit and construct from our family, our teachers, our peers, our community, and our culture. As we go through life, many of us find it next to impossible even to want to question our inherited worldview, while others do exactly that. We rethink, we imagine other ways of seeing things, and we sometimes experience radical conversions out of one worldview and into another." Unquote. Paul, Alma, Moses, Abraham, Joseph Smith, and others experienced these radical conversions or turnings to another worldview. Number six, revelation and inspiration, the receptivity of the spirit. Some of the greatest adventures while living the gospel are the incredible and even ordinary surprises that the spirit often places before us. Joseph Smith said that, quote, it is the spirit of revelation when you feel pure intelligence flowing into you. It will give you sudden strokes of ideas, unquote. Nibley claims that he had daily spiritual surprises, although many were too spiritual and private for him to share with anyone. They were between himself and Heavenly Father. He felt that our own faulty wills and materialistic dreams pale in comparison. Nibley felt that many members of the church wish they could avail themselves of revelation, but they either don't recognize the subtle whisperings of the Spirit or are plain unreceptive to them. And for many of us who minutely plan our days either on paper or electronically, we fail to leave time for the Spirit. The secular world labels these experiences as serendipitous or synchronous coincidences. A profu profusion of them in Nibley's writings appear as insights which, when the reader confronts them, asks himself, where did Nibley come up with such an insight? An example of this occurred to me one day three years ago when I was looking for a female counterpart to Hugh Nibley's diversity in scholarship. I came to work and read the daily biography on my tear-off calendar. On this particular day, it happened to be Hildegard von Bingen, a German nun who lived between 1098 and 1179. I had never heard of her, but now I was keenly interested. I searched the library catalog, found two biographies about her, and began a friendship with a long-departed sister who was not only influential in Catholic ecclesiastical circles, but was a visionary author, theologian, religious superior, and musician composer. In fact, you can currently buy CD, five CDs of her music. Alive at a time before the printing presses, it was amazing that so much of her work has survived. Alive at a, <clears throat> but now she enriches the world with her thoughts, many of which Nibley would have resonated with completely. She also seemed fearless around her male superiors, possessing a kind of prophetic authority. In any case, this serendipitous experience taught me something important about coincidence. <clears throat> David Klinghoffer in The Discovery of God characterizes what Nibley experienced in his daily adventures. Quote, God operates in the world through events that seem to come by chance. His interventions in our lives are concealed by the appearance of randomness, unquote. And Mark Patrick, Patrick Hederman in his new book, Walkabout, offers a different twist to the same phenomenon. Quote, coincidence is one of the ways in which the spirit makes his presence felt without importuning or interfering with free will, unquote. And unless we recognize the operations of the spirit, how could anything be more nebulous? So we turn to nebula. <clears throat> Very early in his life, Nibley had an abiding interest in astronomy to the extent that he shaved off his own eyebrows and darkened the nearest street lamp so that he would have better vision into the night skies. 
<clears throat> and in fact, one of his earliest writings was a poem he called Two Stars, describing Vega and Arcturus as he metaphorically outlined two worldviews. <clears throat> According to the Wikipedia, a nebula is an interstellar cloud of dust, gas, and plasma. And when thinking of creation and creativity, what could be a better scenario? At Nibley's 65th birthday party, academic vice president Robert K. Thomas described a great scholar as not one who depends simply on an infinite memory, but also on an infinite power of combination, bringing together from the four winds, they are cosmic as well as earthly, like the angel of the resurrection, what else were dust from dead men's bones into the unity of breathing life, unquote. Jack Welch follows Brother Thomas with the following, quote, we will be everlastingly grateful to Hugh Nibley for bringing it all together, for taking dusty books and forgotten scrolls and breathing into and out of their words the eternal truths of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. Number seven, thinking out of the box and beyond. Nibley often ignored traditional history and academic assumptions. To him, any discussion worth its salt needed to be open-minded. Quote, in the ancient study of ancient things, excuse me, in the study of ancient things, it is the fantastic and incongruous which opens the door to discovery. Never forget that. In scholarship as in science, every paradox and anomaly opens the door and is really a broad hint that new knowledge is awaiting us if we will only go after it." Unquote. An example of this is that he hated theology. On the Catholic News Service dated December 5, 2005, Vatican City, reporter Cindy Wooten states that, quote, theology is an academic discipline and must follow the rules of scientific inquiry, unquote. Although I'm sure that Roman Catholics would say except for their own theology. And we would say basically the same thing. So is theology really about the word of God as the original words, Greek words would indicate, or the word of man about God, which would actually be anthropology, but then that's been preempted by a discipline. It was headlines like these that provided the beginnings of many of Nibley's writings, an unheard of, unorthodox, alternative approach to something very ordinary. He had a perennial problem with BYU students who would say, I've never heard of that before, as if learning new ideas wasn't as included as education. Eight, <clears throat> seeking balance and understanding the law of opposition. This particular attribute caused me the most difficulty in coming up with the title. Perhaps a quote from Nibley himself will better explain my attempt. Quote, things that appear unlikely, impossible, or paradoxical from one point of view often make perfectly good sense from another, unquote. He explored this creative tension in scholarship by utilizing the spirit to help in earthly learning and mind in exploring celestial matters. In his personal life, Nibley was conservative in religion, but liberal in politics although he saw beyond politics towards the building up of Zion. Our current academic vice president, John Tanner, asks the question, quote, are we breaking into Babylon or building Zion's walls? We sometimes assume that secular subjects are to be learned exclusively by study, while religious subjects are to be apprehended solely by revelation. The prophet Joseph Smith did not draw sharp distinctions between how we are to learn sacred and secular truth, unquote. In more secular matters, Nibley often saw both sides of an issue more clearly than most of us would have dreamed. Often his conclusions would be a compromise between two opposites, but more often he would just leave it at that. An example would be the perspectives on opposites on BYU, quote, I can see two totally different pictures of the BYU, each one a reality. From one direction, I see high purpose, sobriety, good cheer, dedication, 
in a measure of stability which in this unquiet world is by no means to be despised. Then by shifting my position but slightly, I see a carnival of human vanity and folly to which only Gilbert and Sullivan could do justice, with solemn antics before high heaven that make the angels weep. Why take sides or contend? Both of the pictures are genuine." Unquote. In a paper he wrote for the graduate school in 1965, he offers his own unique version of the balance needed in scholarship. Quote, every study should be one, authentic, two, original, and three, significant. Without all three of these characteristics, no study should be published. With all three, any study is certain to find publication without difficulty. Nine, eschatological scholarship as discipleship and consecration. Eschatology deals with last things. Nibley provides us with a very compelling definition. Quote, the eschatological viewpoint is that which sees and judges everything in terms of a great eternal plan. Whether we like it or not, we belong to the eternities. We cannot escape the universe, unquote. Then, from one of my favorite personal quotes, the late Elder Neil A. Maxwell tells us how each one of us can achieve Nibley's grand vision. Quote, for a disciple of Jesus Christ, academic scholarship is a form of worship. It is actually another dimension of consecration. Hence, one who seeks to be a disciple scholar will take both scholarship and discipleship seriously, and likewise gospel, gospel covenants. For the disciple scholar, the first and second great commandments frame and prioritize life. How else could one worship God with all of one's heart, might, mind, his italics, and strength, unquote. Add to Elder Maxwell's injunction, Nibley's insistence that we need to do the works of Abraham and only then can we fulfill at this university the inspired vision President Spencer W. Kimball had in his second century address of 1975. Quote, this university shares with other universities the hope and the labor involved in rolling back the frontiers of knowledge. But we also know that through divine revelation there are yet many great and important things to be given to mankind which will have an intellectual and spiritual impact far beyond what mere men can imagine. There must be an excitement and an expectation about the very nature and future of knowledge that underwrites the uniqueness of BYU." Unquote. Now my conclusion. There are many fine scholars and have been many fine scholars at Brigham Young University. Hugh Nibley is only one example of what needs to happen here at BYU on a grander scale. What made Nibley's scholarship unique was the combination of all nine attributes which I've discussed above. When the church asked him to research the Joseph Smith papyri, Nibley did not have any idea what he was up against, nor the conclusions he would ultimately make about the papyri, but he made the consecrated effort to do so. And in his own words, quote, the bringing forth of the papyrus fragments in 1967 was a reminder to the saints that they are still expected to do their homework and may claim no special revelation or convenient handout as long as they ignore the vast treasure house of materials that God has placed within their reach." Unquote. This new book, The Message of the Joseph Smith Papyri and the earlier 1975 edition are eloquent witnesses to his consecrated efforts and the use of his considerable talents. We also can't forget how far-reaching his influence continues to be, including the added perspective he gave to my own life, making it possible to have my own huge windy nebula. I thank my wife, Signa, my children and my grandchildren for the support they have given me over the years during my, during my rewarding journeys into Nibley Scholarship. And thanks to all of you for coming here today.